Hi, I'm Philip. Um, I'm from beautiful Vienna. I know uh, we'll have lunch afterwards, but just to show you, Vienna is the capital of schnitzels, um, classical architecture, and beautiful women. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're not that lucky, but yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I'm working at Elastic. I'm in the infrastructure team, so I'm providing the internal tooling with my colleagues like Jenkins, Docker, AWS, uh, Ansible, Puppet, Chef Scripts, all those things. And since now is conference season, and I'm out doing lots of conference talks, like today with you. Um, so what am I doing? Uh, in Vienna, I run a database meetup about everything relational and non-relational, and I also run a papers group, where each month we read an academic paper and then discuss it afterwards. So on Monday, for example, we discussed Kafka. So just to stay up to date. And this talk is kind of the combination of these two things. So we'll talk about different databases, but we'll start off by looking at some papers and the academic background, like how did we get here, like how, where does the databases come from, and what is kind of the development, how stuff happened over time. Okay, so databases. Everybody kind of knows databases how they are, depending on how old you are. You kind of have an idea how they developed and what they looked like previously. If you're very young, you just came up with the NoSQL world and this relational thing is already strange to you, um, depending on your age group probably. Um, so the original paper that kind of started everything was called the Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data to Banks. I think that was 1970. Um, and this was kind of the founding moment for relational databases and databases as we know them today. So what the problem was back then, um, everybody implemented something and your how to query your data was totally depending on the database you were using. So you were very tightly coupled to the database implementation and you actually needed to know how is the stuff working internally and only then could you write uh, efficient queries for that. And Cod was like, this is probably not a good idea and I'll do something else. And he uh, created his relational model and normal form. So he created this uh, mathematical model in the background and what this gave him uh, was data independence. So you have the machine, uh, mathematical model in the background and everybody using that model can then build upon that and it's kind of the same structure and uh, approach for everybody. Um, so what he created was uh, the thing in the middle, there, are the, there is a free variable t with the attribute name and there exists a, a tuple uh, with name and diet x and whatever and what you actually, this is what COD did and what we are using today, if you're using a relational database, is the select statement at the bottom. Select name from people where uh, diet at age is null, so all the living people we're interested in. COD didn't work on the uh, SQL query at the bottom, but he just created the mathematical form in the middle. So this is what COD created in his paper. And luckily, people added SQL later on, but the kind of underlying foundation was all from COD. So next step is um, SQL, a structured English query language, which is, uh, SQL was also started at IBM. Um, they had some trademark issues, that's why they had to rename SQL to SQL afterwards, but the original name was SQL and they just removed some letters. And in the end, uh, it was just structured query language, which was kind of put back on top of it, kind of. So this was how the SQL as we know it got started. And the IBM guys then later on pay, uh, published another longer paper where they kind of described how they internally developed how SQL was what we are known, we know it to be now, uh, which is fascinating. I, I think it's like 70 pages or so, and it's a really nice weekend read, and there you can see how they discussed like, should it be called null or empty, or how do we call all these things, and like how did the language actually develop. And one thing I find very nice is that they wrote the that some guy contacted them and asked them about all the specifications. And since they were IBM, they thought, well, we can tell everybody everything because at least at IBM, nothing gets done. So you can just tell everybody what you're doing and nobody will do anything with it. So they told this external guy about what they were doing with SQL. 
And the guy then copied everything. He didn't get the error codes uh, because those were IBM specific, but he took all the rest. And that guy was Larry Ellison. And he was actually the only one uh, who got rich with the SQL stuff. Like all the founders, I mean, I'm sure they are not going hungry at night, uh, but nobody from the guys who actually did uh, all the relational work uh, got that rich. Only Larry Ellison was the one who picked up on that and then cashed in. And so the nice thing about the relational world is it's declarative. You don't really need to define like, I'm getting 100 results back and how to loop over them or anything. It's not an ex implicit programming language. It's just declarative. You just say, I want to have these things and then how the implementation is actually happening. That's up to the uh, query optimizer or the relational database. And this is kind of one of the very nice attributes of the relational world that you don't need to go down into the details. You don't need to know how is the data structured and stored and how do I iterate and loop over it. It's just like I define what I want and this is what I get back. And this is the, yeah, the, the step from the data independence you have from the original paper plus SQL, the actual language implementation, which is now a standard. Uh, this is what the nice attribute of relational databases was. And as you can still see, SQL was kind of built for user interaction. So before that, you needed to be a programmer to query any kind of data. But with SQL, it was suddenly possible that even your secretary could query data if she or he was trained properly. Uh, but these people normally don't, you don't know about stuff like concurrency and data integrity and stuff like that. So these attributes are kind of core to SQL and relational databases. So you don't need to take care of that. That's just inside the available uh, implementations. And on top of all these nice features that are internal, you also have data aggregation. So you can write your own aggregation reports, well, group by some, whatever, which is very powerful. And many of the newer NoSQL databases lack that. But in the relational world, this was very core from the beginning just because it was so easy to just write your own queries right from the start. And this is where all of the this came from. And as everything that is popular, there was kind of a trend and people started writing their own SQL databases. And then Cott did something very, very clever. He wrote another paper where he actually defined what is a relational database and what is not. Because everybody was hopping on the train, even though they had no idea what they were doing. Like assuming that Moav has the most RAM, you're probably not the best person to write a database. Uh, so what Cott did is that when everybody was slapping relational database on their not really relational database, uh, just to hop on one of the buzzwords in, back in the 70s and 80s. He wrote his paper, uh, with, which is called COT's 12 Rules. Actually, there were 13, because like every good person in IT, he started counting at zero, and then went down to 12, so 13 rules, actually, um, where he defined, okay, you need to adhere to these principles, and only then can you claim to be a relational database. And this helped tremendously that relational databases, even though they are different implementations and their minor variations, the general idea is very similar. So if you're working with Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, yeah, there are some differences, but like the mental model behind all of it is very, very similar, which is not true for the NoSQL movement afterwards, where everybody is kind of creating their own world, whereas the relational world, thanks to COD, is very much focused on this one approach and everybody is kind of doing the same and working on the same approaches. And then, first everybody started writing their own databases and there was this huge explosion of possible solutions you could use and then people kind of fell down into this dark age uh, where, yeah, dark age looks something like this probably. You have these very few big vendors taking over the market and everybody else gets either crushed or bought out or, yeah, you're kind of stuck. And one of the problems then back like in the 19th, probably early 2000s was you selected kind of your vendor and then whatever your problem was, you would stick to that vendor. So you would be, for example, an Oracle shop or at some point you fell into the hands of IBM and then you would just use DB2. And it was just very much focused on, okay, we're using this technology. We don't care actually what is the problem. We're just using that solution. And if it's good or bad, we don't really know. It's just kind of working. And there is this very nice uh, blog post by Uncle Bob, 
who's pretty well known in the Java world anyway, uh, where um, he compares it to beer. And he compares the database world, like this dark age of databases, uh, to the prohibition in the US, like in the 1920s, when uh, alcohol was prohibited. The Americans kind of forgot how to produce proper beer. And this is why they were in the dark age of American beers for a very long time. And he says, like, relational databases were in kind of the same spot, that it was not forbidden to write new ones, but nobody did it. So kind of the knowledge how to create proper beer or create new databases was kind of lost. And only at some later point, it was refound. So in the US, we have now lots of microbreweries, and they start to have proper beer again in the US. And the same thing then happened with databases that in the 2000s, at some point, people said, well, this is not where we should be, and we're having problems. We need to write new solutions and need to push further than what all these established vendors are providing for us at the moment. So the first problem people had was that databases were, or at least were perceived to be slow. So you can imagine a um, dog on top, or husky or whatever that is, uh, is your application, which would be much faster. The turtle, on the other hand, that is your database. So that's totally inflexible and slow, and your fast application is just sitting on the slow turtle and not making as much speed and improvement as it could make. Um, so this was the first problem. Um, we'll go into the second one in a bit, uh, but just to illustrate why do we even have this problem. Again, another paper, uh, consistency available, uh, consistent available partition tolerant web services, cap theorem, who knows about the cap theorem? Okay, just very few, okay, then we'll briefly touch on that, um, which is you have three attributes you want to have, but you can have two at most. So what this looks like is you either want to have any combination of these you want to have, but at most you can have two. So consistency is at one point in time, you have one, one view over all your data. So you assume you have your data split up over multiple servers, which you want to have for scalability reasons. At one point in time, if you query any of these servers, you will get the same result back. That's consistency. Do not confuse this consistency with the acid consistency, because the acid consistency is more about going from one consistent state to another. So you're not uh, breaking any not null references, whatever constraints. So in acid, it's about constraints and having a correct data set, whereas the consistency in the cap theorem is about tempor a, a temporal one. So at one point in time, you have one view of the data. The data on all the nodes is the same. Second one, available. Um, all the nodes that are available should be able to process your queries for you. Kind of makes sense, otherwise you're wasting some uh, yeah, performance. And the third one is partition tolerance. Should something bad happen in your network and you have a network partition, so your cluster of X nodes breaks into two pieces, um, you should still be able to serve requests and not just stop uh, working on that or uh, just throw out your data. So you need to be able to work with some kind of failures and network partitions um, to work on that. And kind of the proof in the paper is not very mathematical, but pretty simple. Assume you have three nodes, and then you have a network partition, which can always happen in a distributed system. And then you have, on the one side, you have two nodes, and on the other side, you have just one node. And then you need to decide, am I available or am I consistent? Because the one node on the one side then can decide, OK, I'm not doing anything anymore. Then I'm consistent, but I'm not available. Or I'm available, and I'm probably serving outdated data. Because I'm, the network is broken in half, and I'm inserting data to the two nodes, for example, on the one side, and the node on the other side cannot see that data. And that's the decision you then need to make. Um, though it's not guaranteed that you're getting two of these properties. If you design your system badly, you might get only one of these attributes or zero. It's kind of the trade-off, which can always happen. And if you have kids, or you want to explain this to your father, there is the nice story with Robinson Crusoe. So you have Robinson Crusoe. Uh, he's on his lone island. <clears throat> so he's kind of partitioned from the rest of the world. And 
I think he's English. Uh, so when a ship comes by and asks him a current question, he can either decide, am I available or am I consistent? So if, if he's been asked, like, who is the king of England at the moment, he can either answer, then he's probably not consistent, or he cannot answer, then he's not available. This is kind of the explanation of the cap theorem for kids. And there are messages in the bottle, which is eventual consistency. So at some point, he will kind of catch up with what is going on in the world in the world. And then there are always people who say like, my network is super stable. I don't have this problem with network partitions. So this is just a given. Um, well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, there is this guy, Kyle Kingsbury, with the Twitter handle Afer. Um, be careful if you follow him. It's not safe for work what he's tweeting sometimes, but he's very good at uh, what he's doing. He's kind of destroying databases on a professional level by now. So he's just uh, testing distributed systems and seeing what can go wrong. And one of the things he's often seeing is that people just assume, well, the network is without flaws. And he kind of, in one post, he put together all these things that can go wrong. And he just gathered uh, different information from Amazon, Google, uh, whoever. And he says, like, yeah. On average, in a big data center, they lose, I don't know, one router each day and two wrecks per week and whatever. So all these failures that do happen and can happen, it is a thing. Um, maybe your data center is pretty good, but at some point, you will probably not that lucky and you will hit uh, one problem or another with your network. And then you need to decide. And either you have decided explicitly, am I consistent or am I available? Or if you didn't uh, choose that consciously, something will happen, but you don't know what, which one. Um, so you should always pick the one that fits your need. Okay, and kind of the second problem with the NoSQL world, uh, with the SQL world was the schema flexibility. You have a very rigid schema, and yeah, sometimes it's just not working. So you can just put that into different buckets of how structured your data is. The first one, which doesn't make much sense for databases, is just have unstructured data. You just have bytes on a disk. Not really useful for databases. The next one is easier. You have key value stores, so you have keys, and under each key you store a value, which is already a pretty big step away from relational databases. The nice thing about relational databases, whatever you design your schema, you can query the data, probably not really efficiently if you have not indexed a column, but you can query all the data that you have inside your database. With key value stores, this attribute is kind of lost. You can only query the key. You cannot search over the values. It's just a little less flexible. Uh, on the other hand, it's easier than to split up data and it's very efficient to query data, but it's less flexible. If you just have stuff in the value, you won't be able to get it which, depending on use, use case, is fine. If you're a startup and rewriting everything from scratch every half year, uh, totally good. Uh, if your software needs to run for years, um, it might not be the right approach, or you need to restructure when your requirements change. Next up are a bit more advanced data structures. Uh, first off, graphs. So you have nodes and edges between them which is super efficient if you have, say, you have one node here and one node here, and you want to find the shortest path between these two nodes. This is what graph databases are very good for. What they are not so good for is if you say, I want just to select over all the nodes and find some data. This is what they're not so performant normally. Then you have documents. Everything is JSON nowadays, so most of the document stores are storing JSON. Um, you just store your rich JSON data structures, so you can have sub-documents, you can have arrays, you can store all of these things, you just store them inside your database. Normally, your queries will be JSON, you store JSON, and you will get JSON back. So it's JSON all the way. And then you have the column-oriented uh, databases, uh, which look a bit like a relational table, uh, but first off, you group data into different data families. And another attribute that is very common is that you don't have a single value, but you have timestamped values. So values change over time. So you have the rows and the columns, and then in each field, you could have multiple values over time. So it's kind of three-dimensional. Like a table is only two-dimensional, but if you add multiple values over time, you have a three-dimensional structure of your data. And then you have the rigorous uh, schemas with relational databases. But what you can see here is something that 
the other data structures normally don't support us things like joins. So don't assume all the features you have with your relational databases are carrying over to the non-relational world. Okay, so this combination of speed and schema flexibility created this family of NoSQL, and whereas the relational world is very well structured and defined and all the products are very similar, this is totally not true for the NoSQL world. NoSQL is a very, very broad term and everybody tries to push in their technology and just slaps NoSQL when, when it's fancy on top and just tries to yeah, sell whatever they're doing. Um, so NoSQL doesn't actually mean no SQL, but not only SQL. Uh, but some people actually say the name comes from this. So you know, if you're a consultant, you have the recruiter uh, and they want to sell your services and they just put new stuff in your resume. So if you don't know SQL, they could just write expert in no SQL, um, which is probably not all true. And then there's another buzzword that's always flying around, uh, big data. So if, you have, if you're Dilbert and you have your boss who always wants just to make money uh, and he finds this new thing on the book of Wikipedia, uh, Big Data, uh, which is living in the cloud. Uh, it can make everything much more awesome and can get you more money. Um, so there are normally two ways to view Big Data because people often ask like, how does Big Data fit into this NoSQL world? First one is very broad. It kind of includes everything. You cannot put on one server anymore, but you split out and do over multiple servers. Uh, then NoSQL is kind of part of Big Data. The other one is uh, it's, you're just using it for offline data or a data warehouse. So this is more the Hadoop Spark region. Whatever Big Data means for you, um, we at Elastic are not so happy about the term big data because it just uh, means lots of stuff. And everybody is just shoving in their old technologies and just saying, yeah, we do big data and we're cool again. Yeah. And then there is this, yeah. Just don't, don't overdo it with big data. It's just, yeah, not helping anyone. Okay. So this is kind of the theory background. And now let's see uh, some actual systems and use cases we want to discover. Uh, so there is this DB engines rank um, where depending on whatever your metric is, yeah, you can believe them, you cannot believe them. Yeah, it's like the TOB index, whatever programming language is popular, it always varies and depends. Uh, but you can see, okay, there are some relational databases that are very popular. And on fourth place, there's always already MongoDB. Uh, then there is Cassandra, Redis, and Elasticsearch. So what we we'll look at is these four NoSQL databases. Plus, I picked Postgres because it's also popular, widely used, and available as open source. So as an evangelist, I'm mainly focusing on open source stuff. So we'll just take a look at these five systems and the use cases they're good for or could be good for. First off, MongoDB. Though what I'm saying about MongoDB now could be true for any kind of uh, document store. So you could use Couchbase, CouchDB, Elasticsearch also stores, JSON, and kind of fits into the same region. So this is just one use case where document stores are very nice, I think. So you have your JSON documents, and one very well-known paper um, is the Vietnam of Computer Science by Ted Neuert, when he writes about object relational mapping, um, which is, I think, nearly 10 years old now. Hibernate was just starting, uh, but he has some points, stuff has improved a lot, but still some stuff is valid as of today, that you have this impedance mismatch between object orientation and relations. And these two don't always work that well together. So, Who's used Hibernate or JPA and has written something like this? Do you think this is okay? Yeah, it's, I, I'm okay. This is kind of the Stockholm Syndrome where, where you kind of, yeah, it's, or, or you're in denial. Um, so what is the problem? Assume you have an abstract base class uh, employee and you have managers and workers. So your, your managers can approve funds and your workers have actual experience. Obviously, managers don't have any meaningful experience. Um, so you want to store this structure in a relational database, and you have three options how to actually model that data. Um, first off, you just 
use a union table. You put everything in there. So with two specific implementations and just one attribute each, it's not that bad yet. But assume you have like five different implementations and each one of those has lots of different attributes. Then you have one very big table, but it's mostly filled with null values. So instead of a proper database, you have more like Swiss cheese which, with lots of holes. Um, so yes, you can do it, but you're not really using um, the relational database as you should. Also, you, have, you can normally put lots of constraints, like not null, on your attributes, which you cannot really do. Here, every, in that kind of schema, everything is nullable, and you cannot really enforce many constraints on it. So this doesn't really fit that well. So the, other, the next approach would be you just make uh, concrete instances. You create one manager table and one worker table, which works. But what happens if you need to uh, get all your employees? Hmm. Yes, you can write a union, table, uh, a union query. Uh, but again, you can see it's just like it's very easy to model that in your object-oriented program, but it's not so easy to structure that into your relational tables. And it's just like, yeah, you can kind of make it fit, but it doesn't really fit that well. Um, so the next approach would probably be you just uh, create one table for each class, including the abstract base class, and then you have three tables. But every time you need to query a concrete instance, you will need to join your base table uh, with your concrete instances. Again, it kind of works, but it's just not as nice, and just querying data out of it on, on the database side is just a bit more painful than it would need to be. So if you have a document store, you can do that differently. For example, with the MongoDB example, here I have just used uh, MongoDB pro provides an object document mapper, so it's called an ODM because they don't have relations, they call it ODM instead of ORM. It's called Morphia. That's, you can use that with Spring Data for Spring Data, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, whatever you want to have. It's pretty similar. You just annotate uh, in Morphia the base class with you want to store everything in the collection, which is kind of the table uh, employee. And then you just have your specific implementations, but they are not different uh, than your regular implementation. So you just add some annotations on the base class and define, okay, this is my base class, this is what it's called, and these are the attributes. And then you can insert your data, and it's just like one table or collection or index or whatever you want to call it. And everything you have in your data you have there, uh, and the attributes you don't have, they're simply not there. So you don't have any null values, you don't need to split out your data weirdly, you don't need to join anything. It's just these JSON documents map perfectly to your objects. That's why I think document approach fits the object-oriented approach much better than you need to flatten it out to relations and then uh, need to reassemble and disassemble depending on what step you're in. Any ideas why I have this uh, ugly object ID in there? This is kind of the ID I, I would use. Um, but it's much harder than like a numeric ID. If I have just an incrementing ID, I could just tell my colleague, hey, check out record 5312, and he would easily find it. Uh, with these IDs, it's probably a little harder. Any ideas why I have these ugly IDs? Because I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't want to have a single instance which is uh, doing all the IDs or generating all the IDs for you. You want to be able to generate the IDs in a distributed fashion. This is kind of a trade-off, which is a little less nice to use, but it's, of course, making it much easier to scale out stuff. Talking about scaling out, as long as you're using MongoDB, you can keep all your data in one instance. It's, very it's fine. Uh, replication is super easy to set up. Uh, the problem is with MongoDB, as soon as you need to need sharding, so you need to split up your data over multiple servers, it's getting more and more painful. Uh, so down here, since I, I cannot move away from the microphone, I, I'll just try to point here. Um, here, this is like one replica set. So this data here is stored on one server and then replicated to two others. So this is the kind of normal replication thing, which works fine, 
all your main work is happening on your primary and those are just can be used for reads uh, with a slight delay um, but not for writes. So this will work, but as soon as you need to split out your data, for example, you have so much data or so many queries, you need to, to use three servers for writing data, you will get lots of new components because then you need to have three servers to actually store your data. And then for each one of them, you have a replica set with two more nodes. So this gives you already um, nine nodes. And then you need three configuration servers, which actually keep track of which uh, data or which document is stored on which server. These are these one up here. These are your config servers. And then you need to have the routing servers on where your application lives to actually know which server to query for your data. So you have lots of moving parts in there. So I really like MongoDB for simple use cases where you can simply say, OK, I'll replicate data. Uh, data. But as soon as you enter sharding, it's getting more and more painful. OK, next up, Redis. Simple key value store, though it's providing some more stuff. And Redis, the name, actually comes from Remote Dictionary Server. This is where Redis comes from. So you have some more advanced data structures like lists, sets, sorted sets, uh, which Redis can, set, uh, can use. But what we look at is statistics. Assume you have people logging into your site. And you want to know, or your marketing team wants to know, who has logged in in the last hour into my site to, I don't know, display ads, send them a newsletter, whatever they want to have. So they just want to track the data. And Redis can do that pretty efficiently in two fashions. First off, you could use a bit set, and the second one is a hyperlog log. So for bit sets, you simply have your users who, are, who have signed up. So the first user who has ever signed up gets the first bit of your bit set. The second user who has ever signed up gets the second bit. And for each hour you want to track that, you simply set up a bit set with zeros for all of your users. And as soon as a user logs into your system, you simply flip that bit for the user and set it to one. So you just need one bit of information for each user and can store it. So for a million users, you need something like 123 kilobytes. So for one day, it's probably like three megabytes of data just for each hour to, to store if, the, if a specific user has logged in. So this is already pretty efficient and you can store your data for quite some time in that. Second data structure is hyperloglog. Log. Hyperloglog log has A, a very fancy name, B, there is a paper, and C, it's also pretty clever. So you can store unique elements in it like IP addresses or users or whatever unique elements you have and you will just use 12 kilobytes of data regardless of how many entries you actually have. So instead of having three megabytes per day um, or like 123 kilo kilobytes uh, for like a million users and like doubling for the next million and then getting the same amount for the next one, uh, Hyperlog Log uh, try can is able to have that in a probabilistic data structure. So it's not 100% correct. So it has something like a 99% correctness. Uh, but it's always the same size. So you will only need 12 kilobytes for one time slot to so store your data. And yeah, the command is pf count. It's properly documented there. Um, we're not diving into the paper because that would take longer now. Um, but it's just very good at storing unique elements in a very or in very little space. So it's kind of a trade-off. The, 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 the nice thing about hyperloglog log is its constant size. Bitset is exact because often your marketing team is not really interested in like, yeah, he probably signed in or she probably did not sign in, but they want to be sure somebody signed in or didn't sign in. So this is why bit sets are a good choice for that. And the other nice attribute of bit sets is that you can easily aggregate that. So you have all your zeros and ones for each hour of the day. And for example, after a week, you only care, did a specific user log in during the entire day? And you don't care about the hour anymore. Then you can simply or connect all the zeros and ones of a specific user and then know that person signed in, he or she did not sign in. So these are the two ways you can do that easily in Redis. So 
Overall, my impression is that Redis is very simple to use, and it's kind of the omnipresent glue. You can use it kind of a cheap queue, and you can do lots of caching, keep your sessions, and just store whatever data you want to have there. OK, Cassandra. Um, Cassandra, the name, actually tries to make fun of Oracle already, because you have the Oracle in Delphi, and they didn't actually know anything. They, they were just inhaling some fumes and then had hallucinations. Uh, and that's what the Oracle kind of did. Whereas Cassandra in Troy, she actually saw the future, uh, even though nobody believed her. So Cassandra thinks they kind of know the future and see the future, just nobody is probably believing them. Um, so what Cassandra is good at is scaling and being highly available. So you have consistent hashing, which is kind of the underlying thing that's working how, or that's driving Cassandra. And we'll just take a quick look at how this looks like. So this is kind of the big picture of what it does, and we'll dive into each one of these functionalities uh, quickly. So first off, you have a key space, and each entry you want to store gets some ID. That ID gets hashed. Why do you hash your ID? To avoid hotspots. Um, otherwise, if you would simply take email addresses um, and would shard it over your servers, uh, some servers would, would get much more data than other servers. For example, people starting with X or Q, those names are much less popular than probably people start their names starting with P, S, E, whatever. Um, so you always hash the, the key you have so you avoid any hotspots. You, so your data is pretty evenly distributed. And then, for example, you have three servers, and you just uh, split your data into three uh, equally sized chunks, and the data should be split pretty equally over all of these chunks. Next step is you actually turn the, the, the data you had. So you get from the, the flat structure, you just turn it clockwise to form a ring. And then each server is a kind of put into the, this ring and gets data assigned. For example, this segment here, every, all the data falling into that uh, would get assigned to the server A as the primary copy. And then you have a backup copy going to the next server. So that would go to B. And if you hash Y, that would fall primarily into B and then would be copied over to C again. So if you have this very simple structure uh, where that the key gets hashed and then forced to a server, and you can have one, two, or whatever, how many copies you want to have, and you just um, replicate your data over that. Then, if you either want to add another server, this is nice because it just impacts one server or like that one server and the next one. So, for example, if you want to add a node D here, um, you could simply tell A, okay. Somebody is taking the first half of your key space, just copy over your data to that one, and the nodes B and C don't really need to care about that and don't even need to know it. So scaling up is very easy, but also scaling down or like failing nodes, which is the bottom half, uh, is easy because uh, if server B dies, A knows okay, my copies on that server B are probably gone, so I will just start copying uh, the data I have over to node C. And C also recognizes, ah, B, the data B has owned, where I have a copy, that's gone, so I'm now taking over the primary role, and I'm also copying my data off to the next server. So this is very easy both to scale up and scale down. And to just make this scaling up and down so you don't need to split up the entire key range or move around the entire key range, normally you will just split it down into smaller chunks. And each of your servers gets multiple of these chunks. Normally, these are called V nodes for virtual nodes. So you just split your data not in three big chunks, but in like um, nine smaller ones. And then you can see it's still the, the servers still have the same color, and you just get different key spaces. And if one of the servers uh, fails, or you add a new one, you can simply redistribute these chunks and not like one big chunk, but many smaller chunks, which is more efficient. The only thing is, um, maybe your dad will tell you at some point that uh, Everything that is eventually consistent, or I think the Cassandra guys normally try to call it tunably consistent, which is just a nice form of saying it, um, will at some point 
if your use case is not made for it, fall on your feet. So you might get outdated data at the worst possible moment, which, yeah, depending on your use case, can be totally fine or can be not so fine. However, you can disable that. Uh, in Cassandra, you can say read and write with quorum. So you need to target the majority of nodes, which adds overhead. Um, but it's still possible to do that. But the default mode normally doesn't uh, do that or like, I, don't, I think their uh, documentation is not really recommending it because it's just like additional overhead. Your writes need, always need to the majority of nodes. They need to acknowledge it. And all your reads need to go to the majority of nodes and they need to acknowledge it. Um, but you can do it in a consistent fashion. That's why they call it tunably consistent. And then there are people making fun of that, of course. Um, so they went uh, to immediately inaccurate instead of going to eventual consistency. Um, and you can see MySQL Borat is probably good for, for lots of quotes like that. Okay, Postgres, uh, the elephant and the oldest one uh, of these. Very fitting commit strip. Um, so you probably cannot read it, but I will kind of tell you what, what it says. So, uh, and the, at first, someone says, hey, our relational database is way too slow. And I've created this battle plan. And I have created this big uh, gun chart. And we're now moving to a NoSQL solution. And it will take four months. And I've, yeah, I've planned everything. And it's a big migration. But afterwards, it's just quick enough for everybody to use. And then the colleague says, wait a minute. Let me check the data. And then he says, well, your queries are not using an index. Of course, they are slow. I've created the index for you. Um, the, the query is now 10 times as fast again. Solution is still fast enough. You can uh, stop your four-month migration, and we can simply keep using the relational database, which is true for many use cases. Um, so if, you, if you're just targeting the population of Luxembourg, probably all the data fits on one server, and you can run all your queries on one server. Um, Maybe not. Maybe you have a global audience and, and you have higher scalability uh, targets. But for a lot of use cases, if you still use relational databases in the right way and have proper indexes, which are normally the number one cause of uh, performance problems, either having the wrong ones, having no ones, or yeah, having too many, depending on what you're doing, relational databases can still be very fast for many use cases. And... They're also like calling them relational databases is sometimes a little unfair, probably, because the SQL is not only about relations anymore, but it can do more stuff. So often people tend to call them now SQL databases uh, because they're not only focused on the relational stuff, but the latest SQL standards have introduced some non-relational features as well. And because everybody knows SQL and it's very popular, uh, lots of the NoSQL databases try to put SQL on top, which is kind of funny because you're called NoSQL and then you provide a SQL interface uh, or a kind of SQL interface. So Cassandra created the Cassandra query language, CQL. Google had its the same idea and created GQL. Couchbase was a little more creative with Nickel, but it's still the, the query language. RethinkTB, again, called it just ReQL. Um, yeah. The only thing is, people from the relational world have used uh, SQL for a long time, and SQL is a very big standard and has lots of features. And I think Nickel, uh, Couchbase with Nickel is super proud that, that they are following or have implemented the full SQL 92 standard. And the relational guys then always say, wait, this is like boasting your Windows 3.1 compatible. Because Windows 3.1 was also created in 92. And nobody would try to sell a product today and say we're Windows 3.1 compatible. But the NoSQL guys are super proud that they are SQL 92 compatible by now. So yeah, so that, this is why the relational people are often looking kind of down on the NoSQL implementations. And for example, the Cassandra query language just needs to create lots of secondary indexes to create, uh, query that data. So the efficiency is not that great if you use it that way. Um, so what the relational databases are really good for is you have lots of uh, mature features and you have actually lots of features like joining aggregates and stuff like that. 
Plus, you have more and more the NoSQL influence, like Postgres has its JSONB where you can store and query JSON efficiently. So as long as your stuff fits into a single box, relational databases can still be a very good option. And then there is Elasticsearch, our product, <laughs> um, which is not really a, a database in the classical sense, but it's more for full text search. Um, so I'm always comparing full text search to relational databases are very much black and white. You store data and then you query data and you get your exact, exact matches back. You can use stuff like like queries, but they're, depending on how you use them, not really that efficient. And you cannot do stuff like fuzzy matching and you cannot really define optional arguments. Uh, so this is the database world and full text search is not that black and white, but it's much more shades of gray. So you always have this kind of quality attribute, uh, normally called a score. So you store some data and then you query data, but you're not only interested in exact matches, but what you're actually interested in, like what is the concept or what is the thing I'm looking for and give me everything that is kind of matching. So if you store some things in singular or plural, you don't really care for that. Uh, you just want to have the thing you're actually looking for. Um, so how does full text search do that? First off, you have a text. First step is you re remove any formatting. Assume you have HTML, you just throw out the HTML tags because that doesn't really add much meaning for searching normally. Second thing is you parse the data. Parsing is normally you have white spaces or dots, commas, everything. You will break on these signs and just get the independent words. Next up, you remove your stop words. Stop words are just these little words that add very little meaning to your sentences like articles and uh, yeah, the, n, my, whatever. All of these little words uh, that add little meaning to your uh, query, uh, but would just add lots of new words you don't want to index. So you remove these stop words. Then you do stemming. This is, of course, language dependent, uh, where you just cut down a word to its word stem. For example, if you index beautiful or beauty, uh, both of these would stem down to beauty with an I at the end. So they would stem down to the same thing, kind of the concept. And from now on, uh, if you then search for beauty, beautiful, uh, whatever variation, you would still find everything that's considered beauty, beautiful, whatever. And finally, you can optionally do synonym matching, and then you store all of these words into a big index. And here's an example. You have three documents with a text. You throw out all the stop words, <coughs> and the words uh, you end up with is like best, blue, bright, butterfly, whatever. And then this is called an inverted index. You just store all of these words, and then you actually point to the documents where they are stored. And then you can very efficiently say, okay, give me all the documents where uh, bright and blue is in. And then you see, okay, both words occur in the document one and three, so you will get documents one and through three. But if you want, for example, blue sky, uh, a little down there you can see sky, and sky appears in documents two and three, and uh, blue it's just one and three, so you will get uh, document three is your perfect match for that example. So this is what full text search does. Um, for uh, its indexing structure is not a B tree or just a tree, like for relational databases, which is very good for just finding exact matches and stuff you have in your data. Uh, but you create the inverted index where you actually do the stop words, stemming and all of this stuff, uh, just to have this huge list of all the words. And then you can efficiently search for one word or from, for a combination of words. And you can also like, um, if you store the position where a specific word is stored, you can actually say, I want to have uh, words which are followed one after the other. So you were searching for a phrase. And all of these things you can do very efficiently with full text search. And um, the actually actual power comes from the scoring then. We won't go down into that formula too much. The two things that are most important here are the TF and IDF. This is how you actually rank the documents, how important they are or how good or bad their importance is. So you have the term frequency is 
if a term occurs more often in one document and you're searching for that term, that document is probably more relevant for your search. So if in one document blue is occurring three times and in another word, uh, a document just one time, the document with three occurrences of blue is probably the most relevant for your search. Uh, the opposite is true for inverted document frequency, which is you're searching for two words, blue and sky. And one of them is very popular and occurs in multiple documents, and one is not so popular and occurs just in very few documents. Then the document that appears less often is much more relevant. So if a document contains the less, uh, the less common word, this has a much higher priority than the very common word. So for example, if you assume blue sky and blue might be very popular and sky might not have appear that often, if a document uh, contains sky, this is more relevant than just having the word blue. This is kind of the main idea how you do the scoring in full text search, how to find the relevant documents. Of course, you can tune that and you can boost stuff like saying stuff appearing in the title is more relevant than just in the body of a document and whatever, uh, so you can tune that kind of. Uh, but the general idea is this term frequency and inverted document frequency, this is actually how full text search works. Yeah, and if you want to do more stuff around it, like visualizations, logs, analytics, uh, we also have the full stack about that. Come to our booth if you want to talk about that. So to conclude, this is kind of the how SQL developed. First, in the 70s, there was no SQL, uh, so we have none. Uh, then in the 80s, it was, yes, you should know SQL, because this is the hot new thing everybody wants to use. In the 2000s, it was no SQL. This is crap, like, this is not working as you expect it to be. Then in 2005, people said, okay, it's not only SQL, and now, a little later on, some people got burned by the whole no SQL thing, and they say again, like, no, SQL is actually the thing you should use. Um, this will depend on your use case. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the, the waves and development and fanciness of SQL versus no SQL over time. And then there's always this question, but is it fast? Uh, because some of the solutions love to do benchmarks, I think like a year or one and a half years ago, MongoDB, Couchbase, and Cassandra each did benchmarks, and they each uh, did a benchmark against the other two, and each one managed uh, to find one specific scenario where they were at least twice as fast as both their competitors, and up to like five times. But each one of them uh, managed to do that. So all of these benchmarks are kind of worthless. That's why we don't do them. And I'm always putting up this slide for if when people ask, but is it fast? So I'm comparing how intelligent the squid versus the house cat is under similar conditions. And yeah. You can see, obviously, the squid is much more intelligent. Or if I change the conditions, uh, obviously, the house cat is much more intelligent. So the only thing normally you can guarantee if somebody provides benchmarks is that your numbers will be very different to my numbers. But yeah, people still do it. And I love this one. It's already a little older because uh, FlockDB, I think, is dead by now. And Couch, it used to be CouchDB, now it's CouchBase, and obviously Elasticsearch is missing somewhere. Um, but you, you can um, uh, search through it, uh, since we still have a few minutes left. Um, quickly go through it and find the database where you end up, and I'll just do a quick show of hands. Like half a minute. Okay, so who is Facebook? Who ended at HBase? No one, okay. Uh, who ended up at FlockDB? No one. Any, anybody near for J? Okay, a few. Uh, Raik? Okay. Uh, Couchbase? No one. Uh, Mongo? Relational databases? Uh, yeah, it, it's always the same. Um, like ca coming back to good old relational databases, unless you need full text search, of course. Um, yeah, we have lots of swag. I didn't carry it here. We have lots of swag at our booth. So bottle no openers, um, stuff to fix your uh, uh, charging cables, 
and all of the swag stickers. We have at our booth, come and ask us questions. Um, any questions about the talk now? We still have six minutes left. Please to that watch there. Any questions? Who is already using Elasticsearch? Okay, we have more work to do. <laughs> Any questions from your side? Okay, if you don't have questions, uh, I'm around for the rest of the day. Um, enjoy your lunch.